Welcome. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's really an honor and a privilege to be able to present to you today. And I think I echo other speakers in saying that each of the NARSAD Brain and Behavior Research Grants provides a catapult for us as investigators. But these types of prizes are really a career-lasting catapult. And as you heard, this is the connection between bipolar disorder and heart disease. When I started focusing on this topic 10 years ago, it was something really relatively unknown. And at this point, I would say that it's more recognized, but less recognized is the concept of how this would relate to a young person and how it could affect our understanding of bipolar disorder. So to start off with, in terms of early onset bipolar disorder, it affects up to two thirds of people with bipolar disorder will have their disease onset before the age of 20. And in such cases, it is a more pernicious and more severe disease. And so the question arises, how can we intervene early so that this is no longer the case in future generations? Despite the fact that it's severe, and what you see here is Canadian community health data. So this is not a treatment seeking sample. This is from the general population. And as you scan down this slide, what you can see is high rates of suicidality, high rates of comorbid substance use and anxiety disorders. And it's hard to reconcile that with the fact that the majority of these teenagers in the Canadian population had not sought or received any form of mental health treatment, let alone treatment specifically focused on their bipolar disorder. There's a number of reasons to explain this, and the study itself did not address those reasons, but we have to consider the possibility that stigma about coming forward is still one of the barriers that patients face, even despite the progress that's been made in recent years. And I would argue that looking at bipolar disorder as a cardiovascular disease, one of its benefits is to help reduce that stigma. So these are general population data from the United States. And what you see along the bottom line is bipolar disorder type 1, bipolar disorder type 2, major depressive disorder, or unipolar depression, and then people that have neither of those conditions. And what we looked at in this three-year prospect of study based on American population data was the age of people who had a new onset of heart disease between wave 1 and wave 2 of the study. And what we, can, what we found, as you can see here, is a 17-year prematurity of the onset of bipolar disorder in people, um, of the onset of heart disease in people with bipolar disorder. And you can see that there was also prematurity among people with major depression, but the extent of it, the severity of it, was greatest in bipolar disorder. And so the question that arises is, if fully manifest, fully clinically affecting symptoms of heart disease are already noticeable 17 years early, at what point did the biology that underlies that heart disease go awry? And I would argue that what you'll hear about today is some evidence that it starts at least in adolescence. So on the strength of prior findings, um, I petitioned the American Heart Association together with a colleague, uh, Brian McCrindle, who's a preventive cardiologist. They had previously positioned eight conditions as conferring risk for early and excessive heart disease among youth. And having looked at the benchmark that they set for establishing those conditions, I realized that major depression and bipolar disorder had been missed from that list. And fortunately, over the period of four to five years, we were able to publish this paper in the journal Circulation, which is one of the leading journals in cardiology, which is essentially establishes that mood disorders in youth are conditions that confer increased risk for early and excessive heart disease. And I think what this can do is bring attention beyond people in this room, beyond our friends, our, our colleagues, our patients, into the general population's understanding. So the question arises, why do you see such intense association between cardiovascular disease and bipolar disorder? Why so early? Why such increased risks and increased mortality? And what I've tried to do in this slide is demonstrate the fact that the, the reason is there's no one reason. There's a number of different reasons, and all of them contribute, and all of them lead down in different tributaries to this increased risk of early heart disease. So starting from the left, looking at fundamental biology, processes that affect bipolar disorder and also affect cardiovascular disease, such as inflammation. Then you have things that you might be thinking about um, more instinctively, which is lifestyle, the effects depression has on what we eat, on our exercise, on our sleep, the stress of having a mood disorder, the stress that the symptoms confer in our lives, and then finally the medications. And so all of these together explain why this risk is so significant. Why does this matter from a mental health perspective? The answer is that if you look at people with bipolar disorder, and all the ones in this study are essentially adults, but you see the same thing in youth as well in those studies that have looked at this topic, 
If you have one or more cardiovascular risk factors and you have bipolar disorder, you have a more severe type of bipolar disorder. And I've highlighted suicide attempts. And so the association between suicide attempts and obesity has been observed in general population samples, in treatment-seeking samples, in adults, and in youth. So we can't infer causality, but we know that this is a highly replicated uh, finding. And so the question arises, if cardiovascular risk factors are linked with a more pernicious and severe form of bipolar disorder, could we intervene by purposefully targeting heart health for the purpose not only of extending life and improving cardiovascular risk, but also of improving mental health in the here and now? So for the remainder of the presentation, I'm going to be focusing on a number of different snapshots of ways you can approach this topic uh, to inform our understanding of the heart bipolar link. These are data looking at cognitive flexibility. So if you look in elderly samples, in dementia conferences, there's even journals for vascular cognition. The interface between vascular risk and cognition is a well-established thing in many other areas, but not in youth and less so in bipolar disorder. So although people were skeptical that we'd find anything because the average age of our patients is 15 to 16 years old, we set out to try to replicate data from elderly people, and in fact, we saw the same thing, which is to say, as you can see, I'm not sure if you can make out the colors, but in the green circles, in the line that's trending downwards, you can see that with increased triglycerides, there's reduced cognitive flexibility. And cognitive flexibility is something that's important in people's functioning. How do you adapt to changing contingencies? If you make a, an incorrect response in life, do you modify your approach? Do you change your strategy? And if you can't do that, it's quite impairing. And so what we found was that triglycerides, a type of cholesterol, is related to that cognitive inflexibility. If you look at the blue line or the series of blue circles, you see that that wasn't the case in healthy teens. And so I would argue that if we brought back those healthy teens in middle age or in late life, they would also see that association, but the association appears to be prematurely established among youth with bipolar disorder. So that's the function of the brain. What about the structure of the brain? Um, as you will hear about from my colleague, Dr. Lakshmi Adam, who establishes finding in adults with bipolar disorder, there had been prior findings showing that with increased body mass index or obesity, there are changes in brain structure. And so again, we figured we have this early age sample, early in their course of disease. It provides an opportunity to examine whether these connections are already established. And indeed, they were. And so we looked at two different types of analysis. One was picking regions that had previously been supported by the literature, called region of interest analysis. And then we also looked at data-driven, or um, a hypothetical approaches, which are looking at the entire brain and seeing which regions are related to body mass index. And what we found was, in both types of analysis, invariably, there was a stronger relationship between body mass index and brain structure among the teens with bipolar disorder compared to the healthy teens. And it always went in the negative direction. Higher body mass index, lower cortical thickness or brain volumes among teens with bipolar disorder. Another variable that can be examined to understand the link between bipolar and vascular diseases is cerebral blood flow. So using magnetic resonance imaging, you can look at the volume of blood that flows in the brain in a non-invasive way without uh, radioactive injection. What we hypothesized was that, like adults, youth with bipolar disorder would have lower levels of blood flow, especially in frontal regions of their brain. In fact, we found the opposite and learned that there are developmental differences because the teens with bipolar disorder, in fact, had abnormally elevated cerebral blood flow in frontal and midline regions of their brain. In this study, what you see is changes in cerebral blood flow as a function of a single session of aerobic exercise. So we had teens come in, and it's about a six-hour protocol. You come in, you spend an hour in the MRI, you walk over to a recumbent exercise bike where you do 20 minutes at 70% of your aerobic max, so that's a medium workout where you'd be sweating and breathing heavily but not really suffering. And then you walk back to the MRI and repeat the same scan. And what we found was that after that single session of exercise, both 15 minutes after and about 40 minutes after, uh, this abnormally elevated cerebral blood flow was temporarily abolished, which means the teens with bipolar disorder, at least for that interval of time, looked like the teens that were healthy. What was interesting is, if you consider that elevated blood flow is abnormal and that it normalized, you would think that that normalization would be associated with emotional symptoms of comfort or, or happiness. In fact, we found that those teens who had the largest reductions in their blood flow, so the ones who became most like the healthy controls, 
felt most exhausted immediately after the exercise. So that's an example of where there may be clinical relevance in neuro neurobiological findings, which is to say that something that makes you feel uncomfortable, which may, because of that, be something you avoid, in fact, in fact is actually an indicator that things are going well for you. Another MRI approach. So there's different ways to provoke the blood vessels in your brain to respond, and we're interested in understanding whether the reactivity of blood vessels in the brain among teens with bipolar disorder is similar or different from healthy teens. One thing you can do is give people carbon dioxide, which is a potent vasodilator by face mask. This provokes anxiety or panic on a lot of people. If you can just imagine not only being in the bore of an MRI, but also having a mask, and then on top of that, breathing in a gas, it's pretty anxiety provoking. So instead of that, you can do what's called a breath hold paradigm. And along the left, you can see there that the signal in the MRI changes as a function of whether you're breathing comfortably or holding your breath. As you hold your breath, the carbon dioxide in your blood builds up. That's a potent vasodilator, and you see an increase in the signal intensity in MRI. What you can see along the right is that the teens with bipolar disorder had reduced cerebrovascular reactivity in periventricular and deep white matter. So these are two regions in which we know that adults with bipolar disorder in midlife have early indicators of stroke called white matter hyperintensities. And so the conclusion from this finding to us on a preliminary basis is it could be the case that MRI can help us identify youth who are at exquisitely high risk for developing stroke later in life or at least for having cerebrovascular manifestations. How about getting closer to the connection between heart and brain in a more literal way? If you look at the scatter plot on the left, what you see is the intensity of the MRI signal in the brain over a period of time. And as you can see by the fact that the figure is essentially just uh, looks like spilled dots, there's no significant relationship between time and the intensity of the signal in the, in the brain MRI. But we had a pulse monitor on these teens in the scanner. And so what we did was, instead of looking at time as the variable, we looked at the position in the cardiac cycle. So how did the intensity of the MRI signal in your brain vary as a function of your pulse? And that's what you see along the right. And that was robust, which means that it was very strongly, significantly associated with your heartbeat. So your heart beats, and there appears to be some degree of shake, if you will, in your MRI signal in your brain. And so the question is, can we quantify that, and can we look at what happens to it before and after exercise? And just to summarize the data on the bottom of the slide, we found that uh, in teens with bipolar disorder, there was elevated pulsatility in gray and white matter, and it reduced following exercise. So just to quickly mention um, a recent study that we've been doing using retinal vessels. You can assess these by photography. And it was the first uh, psychiatric patient or psychiatric topic featured on our hospital's uh, magazine, which comes out twice a year, uh, which is our hospital's better known as a trauma and cancer center, and it's led to a collaboration with op ophthalmology and neurology. What we found was that in teens with bipolar disorder, but not healthy teens, there was a relationship between retinal blood vessels and peripheral blood vessels, their mood, and blood pressure. As you can see in the scatter plot, in the teens with bipolar disorder, better blood vessel structure in your eye is related to better blood vessel function in your fingertip. And that brings me to my final point, which is that forecasting the years ahead, the way we're positioning bipolar disorder is a multi-system microvascular disease. So although the manifestations affect brain and behavior, there are also peripheral manifestations, and this could be a way for us to better understand the earliest genesis of the disease itself, but also its link with heart disease. So we're going to be looking not only at the measures that I just mentioned, but also at MRI of the heart and its reactivity to the same breath hold task. So you've heard the teens with bipolar disorder at risk for heart disease for a number of reasons. If they have cardiovascular risk factors, this is relevant both to the structure and function of their brain. A single session of exercise can temporarily normalize some differences that we see. And in my view, the link between bipolar disorder and heart disease, although negative in some ways, is also positive because it can identify for us novel treatment strategies that we're not undertaking, identify for us causes of the disease, and reduce the stigma that keeps people from coming forward for treatment. So I wanted to acknowledge uh, collaborators and funding agencies, including Brain and Behavior, and our team at the Center for Youth Bipolar Disorder, and thank you for your attention.